Hello world, this is Shruti Pandey and today just saying I'm happy is going to be a very, very short word, but I'm more than happy because I have with me Professor L.D. Russell, who has been a professor for teaching religion as a subject at Elon University. And I've become a huge fan and admirer of his after watching a couple of his lectures and talks on YouTube. It just happened a couple of weeks back. And I'm so grateful to you, sir, for giving me your time, for connecting with me, talking with me, and uh, gracing my platform. Thank you so much. I am thrilled and honored to be here, Shruti. Thank you so much for the inv invitation. No, it, it means a lot to me. It's it's simply nothing for you and uh, you don't have to be modest at all. <laughs> this means a lot. It really does. It really does. So thank you again for the time. And uh, if you want to say something, you can, or I, we can straight drive, drive into the questions, whatever you feel comfortable with. Well, why don't, why don't we just go ahead and start with the questions? All right, all right. So my first question for you is, you spent almost three decades of your life as a professor at a university. What mm -hmm. kept you going for all these years? Okay, that is a, that is a good question. Um, I cannot say that it has always been easy. Um, there have been difficult times, but also many jo joyous times. I feel really fortunate to be able to spend time with young people exploring truths about life and honestly what has kept me going is my students to be able to welcome young people into a classroom environment uh, build trust with them which requires some vulnerability on their part and on my part yes. and to try to set things up in such a way that no one dismisses anyone else, that we're all open to each other, that we all stand to learn something from each other. Um, and then just lay before the students some of life's biggest questions, which we tend to think of them as religious questions, but I think they might just be human questions. And it's, you know, first of all, who am I? I mean, really, who am I as a person? Why am I here, right? What is the purpose of my life? Um, is it just an accident? And if not, what is the meaning of it? You know, what is it that I can accomplish in my life? Am I going to have a happy life? I mean, I just, you know, we all ask those questions at one point or another. Also, um, you know, where did I come from? Uh, in terms of family, in terms of community, in terms of culture, uh, and where are we going? Really, where are we going? What, what, what does the future look like? And is there a role that I can play in helping to build that future? Do I, should I just not worry about that? It's all about me, 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 or is there something more important that I'm here to learn and to accomplish? And in the end, is it really just about me or is there something more communal going on here that we're all in this together? We're all trying to figure out what life is about. And one of the ways that I tend to understand religion is it's throughout history, different cultures mm -hmm. have asked these questions and come up with their own answers. And so to be able to sit and compare those answers, not just, um, you know, in, in our minds, but in our lives, right? What is, a, what, is, what is the good life? How is it that I really can be happy? And how can I lead the world a better place than it was when I found it, right? And so to be able to spend time with students and ask those questions, I've been teaching the, basically the same course for, as you say, almost 30 years. And it is never boring because every semester, it's a different group of students. And each of those students, as I tell them on the first day, look, you have had experiences I've never had. You know things that I don't know. Sure. You've been places I've never been. And if you're willing to open up and share that with me and with us, I mean, we are all going to gain so much from our time together. And to the extent that those students are willing and able to do that, there are days when I walk out, of, this is when I know I've had a good day as a teacher, okay? When I walk out of the classroom 
and I am utterly exhausted and totally exhilarated <laughs> because we've really gone there with each other <laughs> and asked some hard questions and, you know, been really honest with each other. And it's just, it, it, it has been such a rewarding career. And as I say, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity. And one of the things that I tell my students is, look, I'm not here for you. I'm here for you right now, but not just while you're in my class, my commitment to you as your professor and as a fellow, as a fellow human being and a fellow wanderer, a fellow seeker of truth is it's a lifetime commitment. And so I call my students, my tribe. Oh. And by, by that, I mean, you know, we're not just one tribe against another no, tribe. That's my term too. I know what you mean when you say the tribe or my tribe. Oh, oh, that's, wonderful. that's wonderful, right? Yeah. We're all, in the, again, it's not just about us as individuals. We're together, right? And, and yeah. all of us together are going to have so much more knowledge and so much more ability to affect change in the world for good uh, if we do it together rather than any of us individually. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Okay. So Elon university has a, a winter term in January and a lot of students study abroad during that time. And I co-lead a course on sacred space in France. And so for the last six or seven, with the exception of during the pandemic, uh, for the last six or seven Januarys, um, with a co-leader, I have taken a group of anywhere from 20 to 30 students to France. And we travel around France and we talk about sacred space and we try to learn about French culture. And the course is called Eat, Pray, Love. And six years ago, I believe it was 2016, um, two of the students who went with us had never met before the course. And while we were traveling around France, they found themselves falling in love. And so they took, they took the love part of Eat, Pray, Love very seriously. <laughs> and so this past weekend, I traveled uh, to the Northeast. I live in the Southeastern United States. I traveled to the Northeast to officiate their wedding. And it was just a beautiful moment. For one thing that they would actually you know, ask me and trust me to do that for them. But to see how open they had been through the whole course in France and how that openness had brought them together. Yes. Um, it was just a really beautiful, beautiful weekend. A lot of other Elon grads came to the, the service. And I mean, I will be friends with these students for the rest of my life. And the investment that I have made in their lives just brings back a, a kind of karmic blessing over yeah. and over and over again. Yeah. And while you were discussing this answer or elaborating on it earlier, these kids are not really uh, like very young, like school kids, right? They are probably 16, 20 or that age. So it, oh, it's, yeah. it gets even tougher to be vulnerable with them. And the way you are so uh, encompassing of their individuality where you're like, okay, I have not been to places, talk to me about those things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so refreshing uh, to even have somebody who asks you such question. And in fact, when you started with, who am I to the entire, you know, paraphrase, mm -hmm. but you reminded me of everyone from Ramana Maharishi to Alan Watts. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, he's, he's like the all-in-one. And I think it's because of you that that couple met on the trip and it was really uh, right on their part to ask you to felicitate their wedding because, and I'll tell you, this there's so much similarities between us. Like when you said the word your tribe, that's what I call my people, like my tribe. And I don't even know how it came to me, right? And ironically, it was 2016 when I first used that term. And one of ah. my two sister was like, wow, why did you say that? And where did you get that? I was like, I don't know. So it was 2016 when I was like, okay, this is my tribe. And oh, yeah. Eat, Pray, Love is 
is one such movie I just love because every time you watch it, you learn something new. I feel it about it that way, and uh, I don't want to make it controversial or demeaning and disrespecting to anybody. But I absolutely love Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. I never read it. I watched the movie. I know it's very controversial, not just in the West, but you know, even in India, when I would ask questions to my Christian. friends or family friends it would disturb them but that is the reason why i fell in love with you know the entire uh, museum and france and all that side of the world because i was like maybe someday i i want to visit that side and you know pay my respect and tribute so again having a course like that calling it eat, eat pray love and <laughs> taking it all to france Right, it's like the time of the life. <laughs> well, it, it's a crucial time, right? Uh, a, a lot of young people are asking questions that, in a way, that they may not ask later in their lives, and to offer them an opportunity to sit and compare notes with each other um, in the presence of someone who ha has had a little more life experience. I learned so much from them. One of the things that I, that I love about late adolescence, early adulthood, is that people tend to be more open at that point than they might ever be in the rest of their lives, willing to question. And one thing about young people, uh, many of the young people that I deal with, they, pardon my French, but they know bullshit when they hear it and they will not abide it, right? They're not stuck in ways of thinking that many people my age are. Um, the world is still open to them. And it, it, it's part of what makes that time of life difficult because you don't have a lot of life experiences and you have all these questions and you have to make some decisions about your life's path. Um, but I just, at some point in the semester, a student is gonna say something about something I've thought about, you know, uh, about Hinduism, about Christianity, about a, a particular religious teaching. that I've thought about you know, for 40 years, but they'll say it in such a way that it, it gives me a different insight into that teaching, whatever it might be, right? And so for me, to, it, it's a way of being a lifelong learner, which keeps my brain alive. And honestly, it keeps my spirit alive yeah. as well, yeah. What you're saying. I mean, at a soul level, you're just learning so much in this one lifetime, just because mm -hmm. teaching so many kids. And uh, I have had, you know, male, female teachers and professors, but I have, and with all due respect to all my teachers, because I love them all. I, I feel a lot of gratitude towards all of them because I feel what I am is because of them. But I've mm -hmm. never seen, you know, uh, not getting into the gender thing, but mm -hmm. I've never seen a male professor who is, you know, so... Uh, motherly also towards his kids and don't get oh, yeah. me when I say motherly but really the, the kind of compassion and care and kindness you have towards these kids it just shows when you talk about them oh yeah I really do care about it it's one of the reasons I'm having to retire because it's difficult to care about you know 80 to 100 young people <laughs> all at the same time that's a lot of weight to carry and I have carried it gladly um and you have yeah. no idea how many students you inspire uh thanks to the technology and digital world we live in because i always thought uh i never envied the students right but i always thought that it would have been so much amazing to sit in this man's classroom and just witness the awe <laughs> <laughs> thank you so and much i'm i'm, I'm blushing But yeah, I feel so lucky and this all feels really surreal and dreamy still that I'm doing this with you. But yeah, it's it's just, you know, that these are the times when I actually, and there are not much times when I thank technology, despite being a B-Tech in information technology. Like these are the, literally the times when I thank technology that I can see someone, I can learn from someone and it's it's the magic it's it's the beauty of it and i i rather than extending this one i'll ask my second question to you which is how did you choose religion as your subject like okay nobody would pick that <laughs> right uh, um that that is true actually you might say that my subject chose me oh 
that I grew up in, as I said, the Southeastern United States. Uh, I came of age in the late sixties, early seventies, which was a time by the way, when a lot of young people were asking big questions, right? And challenging authority and insisting that the way things have always been is not the way that we necessarily have to live our lives. Cause they're looking at older people and seeing that in so many ways, the old way simply was not working or certainly not working for everyone, uh, which was an exciting time to come of age and also a scary time. And so um, in high school, when I first began to figuring out who it was that I wanted to be, I chose to be a hippie. And <laughs> in part, it was kind of the thing to do at the time, right? Uh, it was a tremendous fad, not just in the United States, but in other parts of the world as well. But unlike many of my contemporaries, I took it very seriously. And I have never, I, I am happy to say that I am still an unrepentant hippie. And by that, I mean, I believe in peace and love and happiness. I believe that humans can and will sooner or later figure out how to live together in peace. I believe that every human being should be completely free to be who they are, as long as they do it in ways that do, that does, that do not um, denigrate, take away from the freedoms of others. Um, it was a vision that I caught, you might say. And by the way, it was during that time that I was first introduced to Indian culture in a personal way. Through the music of the Beatles, when I heard George Harrison play the sitar, right. it was a sound I had never heard. And immediately I recognized it as if I had grown up with it. And so that took me to Ravi Shankar, whose ragas are, which by the way, are devotional, you know, songs, as you know, um, are, it's just one of my favorite forms of music. And <laughs> at some point in there, when I was 16, I had a huge religious experience that caught me completely off guard. Um, to this day, I don't know, I still don't know whether I was touched by the hand of God or I had done too much LSD or whatever it was. It was the early seventies after all, but whatever it was, it completely changed me as a person. It just shook me to my core. Um, and because I realized this now, I certainly did not at the time because of where I was and the upbringing I had had and the fact that the religion surrounding me in that in that particular culture was a was a, a form of evangelical Christianity, which brings so many beliefs with it and expectations for morality with it. The way that that experience that I had was explained to me, and the way that I was able to understand it was through the lens of that particular form of religion. But Shruti, I've wondered many times, let's just say I had grown up in Mumbai, right? And at that same age, I had had that same experience. Would I have understood it the same way? Because I know that there are Hindus who have deeply meaningful life revolutionizing experiences and they tend to understand those experiences in the context right in the bubble if you will of their own culture and their own religion you could say you know if if, if it had happened in japan it might have been a zen buddhist experience for me does that make sense i just want to check absolutely, in absolutely absolutely i i got emotional at, at the point when you said you had a you know the hand of god and that too at the age of 16 like that's too much uh, to go through, you know, at a, at many levels, plus the time you were growing in, I, I don't imply by age or anything, but, you know, yeah. everything, the demographics of a country or a place is so mm -hmm. dynamically and rapidly changing and all that you're in the West and mm -hmm. particular kind of a commune. Oh, good God. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it was what happened. And, and I realize now, too, that that was happening to a lot of young people, uh, again, in the United States and elsewhere. A lot of people who had been 
uh, whose minds have been opened by the hippie vision of uh, peace, love, and happiness yeah. found themselves drawn to a particular form of Christianity. The, the term that is used for those people is the Jesus people. Uh, but again, I did not understand it at the time. I just knew I had, had this major experience. And so I decided because it had touched me so deeply that I couldn't do anything else but dedicate my life to God, right? And so I went to school. That's If it had not been for uh, my church, I would never have been able to attend college uh, because, you know, my dad was a mill worker. My mom worked as hard as he did raising three sons. Um, and no one in my family had gone to college. Um, or at least had finished college by that point. So that sent me on a journey in and of itself because I had been taught by my religious background that the form of Christianity in which I was raised was the only true form of religion and every other religion is wrong. And every other religious person in the world is gonna go to hell, okay? That's what I was taught. And they, I remember my pastor warning me before I left for college to be careful not to pay any attention to the other religions. And so <laughs> I took a world religions course in which I was introduced for the first time to Judaism and Islam and, Christ, and um, well, actually Christianity from an academic objective perspective rather than from an insider perspective. I was introduced to Hinduism, and in particular, again, I was so taken by Hinduism, it, it helped me to realize that not only is my religion not the only one, it might not even be the most interesting one. And so I began to explore these other religious traditions. Um, and at the same time, I'm studying Christianity objectively for the first time and beginning to realize it wasn't what I had been taught that it was, that, that, that it had its own problems and its own dark side and, you know, racism and sexism just baked into it from the, from its foundation. And so that sent me into a religious crisis in my twenties, uh, which was a very frightening time, but also a very important time because I, Again, for the really for the first time, I was asking those big questions. Who am I, right? And who am I going to be? And how do I find my way in life? And <laughs> that kept driving me back to school. Like I needed to be in a classroom where I could ask those questions and wrestle with them alongside other people. And that eventually led me to my career where I have managed to make a living by doing exactly the same thing. When I go into that classroom and I ask those students to sit with those questions, I'm doing the same thing. I'm still asking those big questions along with them and taking notes on their insights, right? And sharing with them my own. So that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, from the moment you were 16 to you getting to 20s to you going through this entire journey of asking questions, mm -hmm. you know, you made me live, imagine or visualize your life in some way. Mm -hmm. And it's very powerful. Not many people can do that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hate it when uh, people these days call it either content or storytelling or something because it's just so demeaning. Mm -hmm. It's really not that. And uh, everything is, is really an art and a skill. And mm -hmm. to talk it all, if we are sharing our journey, that to our personal life journey, th these things are personal, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. if we are not matured enough or if we don't have the proper understanding, uh, if I talk about my spiritual spirituality and spiritual awakening and stuff, people might think I've lost it <laughs> or something, right? So right. it's not storytelling or something, but the, the fact that you have been on this journey and I'll tell you something, I, I don't know why, but I... I do find this very ironic. What if, what if in, in some lifetimes back, I was in Egypt or in the West or somewhere mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. you were here which is why you when you first heard sitar you were like okay this is something i've known and you know sitar is is the instrument of goddess saraswati who is the goddess of learning oh yes so oh yes you were like <laughs> always somehow associated with teaching and learning and the first thing which took you by everything is is the sitar and i think it was a hint from the goddess of knowledge herself <laughs> that's a, that is a great insight i never thought about that but it makes perfect sense saraswati is just one of my favorites yeah <laughs> yeah i think i mean for teachers for education and <laughs> or institutions like this like I I don't know if there are the gods, but she's the one that's coming to my mind, and maybe it's it's my upbringing and thing. But yeah, mm -hmm. she's associated to being the oh, god. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe that explains why I have a draw, like a natural. Uh, you know, I get drawn to uh, Abba or uh, Frank Sinatra or Four Seasons. <laughs> There's so many. You know, the black and white time people where. Oh I'm, yeah. I listen to a sway with me, and I'll be like, "Oh, what a music!" And yes, these are timeless classics. But uh, you don't get attached to any song for the heck of it, right? And sometimes I genuinely feel, "What if uh, the gods really must be crazy, and they just swapped us all?" <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> now you better go to this place. <laughs> that makes as much sense as anything else, right? And honestly, I think that really is just. I mean, you know, we separate religion from other aspects of life yeah. and we think of it as this, you know, this, this whole thing. I just, it's a part of being alive to ask these questions. We're all trying to figure out the truth, right? And we can call that religion if we want to, yeah. but is the, the atheists that I know, some of the, some of my dearest friends, right? They themselves are trying to figure out what's going on, right? And so, and this may lead into that third question, I'm not sure, but I believe it was a great Hindu sage who said once that truth is the mountaintop and that we're all, every religion, and I would say every philosophy, right? Even atheists, we're all trying to reach that mountaintop. Why would we throw rocks at one another? Why yeah. not work together to help each other to reach the top? It's not a race. Right, I mean, and I think uh, ironically, I'm not sure if it's Hinduism, but uh, we actually feel that sometimes God really acts in mysterious ways and reveals Himself or herself to an atheist because He is so, you know, stubborn with His one philosophy. Whereas uh -huh. a devotee, he or she could be any religion, they keep wavering, right? You know, mm -hmm. you might lose faith, you might hate God, you might fight with Him. Like we mm -hmm. think of God as an entity, right? Any religion, be it yours, be it mine. And we yeah. some days get angry. <laughs> we some days mm -hmm. feel like, okay, uh, today I prayed to Durga. Maybe tomorrow I'll bribe Jesus and he'll get my work done. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the God sometimes reveals themselves to the atheist because they are so focused. They don't oh, yes. <laughs> like us. And honest, I wonder sometimes if... God is energy, right? The energy of life. And that you and I and every other human and every other creature are all, we are living the life of the, the divine out into the world, right? Yeah. In other words, God is trying to figure out who God is in us. I mean, that again, that's one of the ideas that I have. I don't know the answer and I'm okay with that. I, I, I'm comfortable sitting in the presence of mystery. I haven't always been, but I am now. But what a fun <laughs> thing to contemplate, right? Because it says so much about how important it is that we come together as you and I have today, right? As we are with your, with your viewers uh, to, 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 to have these discussions and to be open with each other. And honestly, to help each other along our paths, right? Why else are we here? Who knows, uh, uh, listening to this, maybe, if not many, few, <laughs> one, one person would get some answers to this. And I think I would be very grateful if it makes sense to even one person, because I don't expect this conversations to make sense to a lot many people, very frankly. And that's fine. Like everybody's on their own journey. This is no rad race, right? You can have a rad race for money, for titles, designation, but oh yes. 
all this growth is is not rat race and you can't uh, bribe anybody and get that stage and growing and the moment you said energy uh, god as energy i literally got goosebumps and it also reminded me of uh, you you remember that scene from the matrix where the guy he looks on the different uh, binaries going on the screen and he's like i don't look at them uh, like he knows who's a blonde is a brunette and this that particular scene where he just goes right i don't, I don't right. even and what if we really are like that right like code or frequency or energy and we just look like this to each other because of maybe oh, yeah. in the eyes but we actually are really yeah. well so many of the religious traditions push their believers to think beyond individuality that you know buddhism for instance that will actually tell you that individuality is an illusion and it causes our suffering because we think that we are separate from one another but when we're all to you know together as a species and i and honestly i think climate change can help us understand it's just as the pandemic what has been an opportunity to think differently about things oh, yeah. that, that we are one organism and we need each other to work together in order to overcome the challenges that we face whatever they may be racism sexism right climate change you name it mm -hmm. um the sense of cultural superiority right that, that causes so many problems uh and the more we understand that your fate and my fate are inextricably linked Yes, right? absolutely. I think we might be more willing and able to look beyond our differences and understand that we have so much more in common. Uh, I, I want to mention two things and I'll wrap this up and have a second part because I have one more question left for you. Uh, okay. One is, uh, again, this might sorry people like there there are times when i've been watching you know i i'm too much into history and understanding things and uh, i love to watch documentaries i mean if i was watching your lecture there's something really very <laughs> unique mm -hmm. let's put it that way about me right and i mean i've always been curious to understand like uh, you know the missing years of jesus or mm -hmm. ironically i sometimes even watch a documentary which says what if the direction of mecca is not the one which people are looking at because there has been so many case studies which is pointing to Petra and not Mecca and th there are so many things so these things are really you know one of my favorites to understand with all respect and love towards all of them right I think that's the foremost thing which my culture or religion teaches me that to be uh, receptive of everybody and I think that's how India sustained all of the different diversity right which is why we say unity and diversity otherwise you don't find so much i remember in one of your talks you you said something like i have not seen a room such so colorful in a very long time right <laughs> and india is colorful right with all the variations that we have and oh, yeah. thank you for bringing a uh, pandemic up because i think what if uh i mean yes psychological things and everything everybody is stuck with the same people but what if the pandemic just uh you know reminded us of some past generation or past life things and we were like oh my god maybe i was boxed in a room maybe i was boxed in a cage and it just resurfaced us all the programs and codes that we were back then mm -hmm. and on this note i'm going to stop this here and have a part two <laughs> and ask my final question to you. Okay.